we're speaking with Professor uh, Rick van der Ploeg at Hotel Le Charme in Maastricht. It's the morning after he gave the 2009 Schumann Lecture at Maastricht University entitled Political Economy of Re Reinventing Europe. Uh, Mr. van der Ploeg, good morning. Good morning. Uh, during your presentation last night, you said that it isn't popular to say, I'm a European, uh, and that it has become politically correct to, uh, I think your words were, take the piss out of Europe. Mm -hmm. Um, but during your introduction, you mentioned that you feel like you're a European as opposed to a Brit or a Nederlander more mm -hmm. than anything else. So uh, if it's such an unpopular uh, identification, why do you refer to yourself as a European? Oh, well, you have to be, just because it's unpopular, it doesn't take away that, uh, that, that I feel like a European. I mean, I, mean, I like uh, uh, Bob Wills and his Texas Playboys. Most people in the Netherlands will never have heard of it and think you're crazy to like the type of Tex-Mex music. Mm. Um, no, the, the serious point is this, is that um, many politicians have used Europe to really blame unpopular policies on Europe rather than taking the blame themselves. Um, mm. So, for example, that's given way for extreme parties on the left to say, that, uh, look, Europe, it's all about neoliberal, it's all for capitalists, it's not for ordinary people, it's not for workers. Mm. It's really a bastard right-wing project. We mustn't vote for Europe. And they've been able to grow on that. The same thing, uh, same side on the, on, 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 the, on the extreme right. They have very populist parties. Maybe not fascist, but fairly right-wing populist parties. And they've been arguing Europe is opening the borders for everybody. Uh, we're suddenly getting all these migrants. The European culture is being attacked. And look now, they want to get Turkey in as well. They get full of Muslims. And these populist parties would argue, look, it's your local identity, you're a Maastrichtenaar, you're not a European. And of course, you are a Maastrichtenaar and a European. But they would argue that Europe would kind of basically make a homo homo homogenous kind of, kind of blur of identities and would kind of basically uh, get rid of all cultural identities. So the right has, has made those points and really have been growing a lot as well, uh, using Europe to get to popularity. And say the mainstream parties, the Greens, Christian Democrats, Social Democrats, and even, say, liberal parties, have really uh, lost out quite a bit on that. And as a result of that, actually, Europe, as a European project, what needs to be done, and there's so many topics still need to be, to be covered, uh, new topics on the agenda, they're not really getting the attention they deserve. So in the actual fact, Europe is a, a continent without teeth. It's, it's, a, it's a joke, it's, it's a risé uh, for the rest of the world. Uh, people in America say, who the hell do we have to phone? We have, we have to phone, we want to speak to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of, of Europe. Who, indeed. Uh, who do we want to speak to if we want to speak to? Who's Obama's equivalent? Uh, uh, are they the Prime Ministers of Europe? Is it uh, obviously uh, uh, Sarkozy thinks he, it's him, but also think it's him. Uh, but there is no unified head of, head of Europe for others to talk to, and that eventually undermines the power of Europe on the global uh, theatre. Um, what does that mean? Like, what is what is it uh, distinctly to be a European? What, what what identifying characteristics would you give that? Well, I mean, if you're an American, you're an American, yeah. But you may also be from Texas, or you may also be a Texan. Is obviously very different from somebody from New England, and yet both of them are Americans. And I think it's fairly similar in Europe. And Europe is actually more interesting because we all speak different languages. Uh, so you are, of course, foremost, maybe you're a Dutch person, not even a Dutch person, you may be from Maastricht or you may be from Groningen, so you have a local identity. But it means to have a common Europe, it means that you have a, a politics at the European scale to tackle the big problems, to have a common currency. Imagine before, you can't even imagine how it was when each country had their own currency, now we have at least one currency. The fact that we might have a, a common defence, we don't really have that. So, for example, if there is a, a, a war somewhere in Europe, that we can actually solve our own problems rather than having to ask the help of our American friends, which is the most outrageous thing you can imagine. That we have enough political leverage, enough p political leadership at the European level to really make progress on, say, climate change policies. We have a big problem on terrorism, uh, like you have in America. But all these countries in Europe, they have all intelligence offices. And these attention officers are not even prepared to share information. So at that point, like, it really doesn't I mean it's not even possible to do an anti-terrorist policy at the European level. So everything is slowed down, it's more complicated, and it's basically not very good. These are all, all topics which lend themselves for European politics, because these are all problems which transgress national boundaries. 
and should be dealt with at the European level. And that's really what the election should be about. And the election should not be about uh, neoliberal projects or uh, the problem of too many Turks. It may be interesting, but there are so many other topics on the agenda as well, which basically do not get discussed. So these are diversions there, they're sort of like sideshows? For me they are sideshows, because I mean, uh, in the end, uh, whether Turkey is a member or not, effectively it's already a, a member of Europe anyway. Um, you said um, uh, during the lecture that uh, you showed us an alternative European flag that was composed of all of the national flags of Europe. And um, you said something uh, to the effect that Europe needs better branding, uh, more dynamic symbols of state, I'm assuming, from that. I mean, would, would you like to see Europeans, for example, the way that Americans do, stand up for their national anthem? Or, no, or that's all. I mean, I'm, I'm half British, so I think you should always stick a little bit of Mickey out of yourself. But I mean, it is, it is interesting that when we had to redo the treaty because it was rejected by the French and the Dutch. The new proposed treaty was basically we, we cross out any reference to European symbols. It was, went completely over the top. They were so scared of the people that, uh, no, we can't have a European flag, we can't have a European anthem. Who cares if you have a European uh, What's wrong with a European anthem or a European flag? If you say it now, they say, oh, no, 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 the voters don't like it. The voters don't vote against Europe because uh, of a European flag or a European anthem or because Mozart and Beethoven were Europeans. They vote against Europe because they don't like the way politics was conducted. It was conducted behind closed doors. They don't vote for Europe because it has not been explained properly to them that all the jobs that have been generated uh, by the common currency and the common market that has actually directly benefited many countries in Europe and, and most citizens of Europe. They, they, uh, there's a certain resonance, a certain gut feeling that all the migration that's due to opening up the borders of, of, of Europe, but that was true before that as well. So there, is, so there is really, when Europe is unpopular, and I gave a whole range of, of, of reasons for that, it's not really to do with having a common flag. So this is all symbol politics. <laughs> so, so, so all these people then decide, okay, we mustn't call it Europe, we don't call it the treaty, we call it something else, but anything but, but a treaty. But of course it is a treaty, and, uh, and of course there is a, a European uh, uh, way of doing things, uh, and you can pretend it's not there, but then you're really cheating your own electorates again and not taking them serious. You said earlier that um, <clears throat> Europe is a, a place without teeth, um, and you made specific reference last night to the European Parliament uh, that uh, reforms weren't really going to make the Parliament more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, why is this, and do you think that this is by design to an extent? Well, it is by design because it's part of the treaty. Uh, now, the new treaty tries to give the European Parliament a bit more bite vis-à-vis -vis the Council of Ministers, so they are allowed to co-draft, but then if you compare them with the powers of national parliamentarians in Britain or in the Netherlands or in France or Germany, where all these, all these parliamentarians have the ability to put a law through Parliament themselves, to send ministers home, all this type of stuff is really, compared with that, the European Parliament is very weak, is, is very impotent, has no teeth. Uh, you said that Robert Schuman's uh, generation uh, thought of a united Europe as a way of preventing um, war, yeah. um, more apocalyptic wars, yeah. uh, generally speaking. Uh, you also said that today these old arguments about European identity don't impress, um, I think you referenced populist politicians and many young Europeans. Uh, Why do you think that this old idea of Europe doesn't impress them? Um, well, partially because there are many young people are, are now worried about problems of the environment, nature, uh, quality of life, quality of living, climate, all those topics. Um, and they've also seen that when there was a war in Europe, in former Yugoslav Republic, that the Euro Europe was basically unable to do something about it. It just happened under our eyes, just, just a bus ride away from here. And we were unable, a bus ride away from here, less than one day in a bus. People were, ki were killing each other off. Uh, uh, in the Netherlands, 7,000 people were killed under the eyes of Dutch soldiers. Uh, nobody did anything about it. So, what do you mean, never any war in Europe again? You've had it. You, so, 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 yes, I, I actually believe that uh, if you don't have a common Europe where you unite yourself, that it's the, the safest, it's the best possible way of guaranteeing uh, stability. Um, the fact that the Czech Republic is part of Europe, that Poland is part of Europe, makes the whole place a safer place. So I still think those arguments are important. They are very important. So that's what I said yesterday as well. But at the same time, that's not enough to convince people to, 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 to 
of the importance of Europe. Do you think that the lessons that impressed Schumann's generation have failed to make their way into this uh, this era? I think I think they are very important of lessons, so that that never divided Europe. But at the same time, and so then the last 30, 40 years after the war, we've made sure that we've got an economically integrated Europe, having a complete one common market all around Europe, uh, one common currency. So we've got never any war, stability, economic prosperity. But now we have about the quality of Europe. So that means safety in terms of no terrorism. It means how we can get all these new people coming to Europe, how we can make them feel Europeans, how can they contribute to the European way of life. And lastly also, how can we do something about environmental quality. So basically the nature of the agenda, we need to look for a new pillar, a new agenda for Europe. And uh, hell, there's enough to say on that. It's, it's not just Al Gore who has a monopoly on how important the climate is. And I think many of these things, there's just no incentive for any country to go it alone. Because if you go it alone, for example, for example, heavy anti-pollution policies, then basically you're killing off your own business and all the other countries say thank you very much and they have more business. So it's, but if you do it all together, then you don't have that problem. Yeah. And therefore you need to do it at a European level. You just mentioned uh, Al Gore and last night you made a couple of references to Barack Obama and the American presidential election and how there was a, uh, there was a fight, uh, a bit of, a, of a, an ideological uh, confrontation. I get the impression, uh, listening to you, that you're a bit frustrated, um, not just by the political impasses uh, within European government, but you seem to want Europeans to have a passion for their politics. Uh, is, that, is that true? Or do you think that there's a, a lack of... Yeah, I know what I want. You cannot... I th I, it begins with the politicians. Many of the most important topics of this century uh, should be dealt with at a, at a, at a supranational level or at a European level. And then what we see is that all the big battles, political battles, the battles for ideas, they don't happen in the European Parliament. They don't happen at the European level. Sometimes policies get done, but then later on, most of these policies are just transposed into national legislation without even discussing with the national parliaments. They're not even discussed. 80, 90 percent of rules and laws coming out of Brussels are just you know, silently, kind of stealthily done, uh, which is strange. Uh, so, and also because say our president of Europe will be appointed for two and a half years. Now if he had a five-year term, possibly renewable for another five years, maybe a maximum of two five-year terms, not, not because it's, that's the way it's in America, but because then one of these guys, say, say Angela Merkel, I, I, I said as a suggestion, she could come up with a platform, with an agenda, could really fight for it, could fight against say, maybe Tony Blair from the left or whatever, and then one of them would win, and then they would choose their own commission and they would choose people the, the, the ministers of Europe, to, who are best fitted to deliver the agenda that has been done. Well, that's not the way it's done at the moment. At the moment, kind of the president, but also, who the heck is he? He's never fought an election. He came out because he's the worst one at all, and he, he will never pose a threat to the council of ministers. So the guys who come on top there are the guys, who, they look for a weak person, uh, typically prime ministers of, of Luxembourg or this guy from Portugal, because they are never going to be, have really any, any, any real power. So the, the national politicians are so scared stiff that somebody really strong like Jacques Delors comes along that they try to do it in this way. So really when it's opened up to a real election, uh, then the person will get the legitimacy of the vote. Like Obama has more power than is given by his term of office. Basically because he's got the large popular support of the country at large. So he cannot do an agenda of reform and he's completely entitled to it. You think, uh, uh, well, I mean, just as a, as a reference to European politics, does Barack Obama have more power than George Bush did, who didn't really have the popular consensus? Yes, of I think he does. Yeah. And he, has the, he has the support for that, and, uh, and then he has the energy which goes with it, and also he, he generates the energy by others. He, he's basically the agenda, or his agenda is internalized by a large part of the population, not only in America, incidentally, but also as a and it, but it's basically, he's fought for his ideas. First uh, with Hillary Clinton, then with the Republicans. He gained his term of office, and then he's going to do his agenda. It's all very clear. Uh, in Europe, we don't have that. We just have strange people get suddenly appointed to be commissioner, fall down by background politics. Often there's some politician who needs to be promoted away. Uh, and then what you get is people, it's, it's of no relevance at all to the people of Europe. And the people who do have elections are the parliamentarians of Europe. 
but they don't have any bite or power. So no wonder people think it's, it's, it's a bit of a, a sad show. Um, you used some interesting phrases last night um, in response to some questions you got from the audience. Uh, specifically, uh, you mentioned battle democracy, that you'd like to see a Darwinian struggle for ideas. Uh, and you also said, and I found this very interesting, anything that smacks of consensus makes you worried. Um, well, I mean, you can have a consensus ex post, but not ex ante. Uh, so people, of course, eventually you always have to have consensus to get any policies done. But ex ante, people will differ in their opinions. You'd have that battleground, and that battleground should not go behind closed doors. It should be out in the public so that people... See. And whenever you don't have it, you basically castrate politics. Because people think, what's the point of voting if it doesn't make any difference, if you only see the blurred consensus at the end of it? So you want to see what did people originally send or what did they fight, how did they do it, and then where can I get my vote? At the moment you don't really see that. Uh, going back to the to, to Schumann and the eyes of the one minute or so. Sorry? I have one minute and I have to run. Oh, okay. Um, so, um, okay. last question then. Um, <coughs> that was I missed my train and I have a... No problem. Um, you said that the anti-European areas like Sweden want to see greater fiscal federalism. And um, uh, I'm wondering, the question that popped into my mind is what's the difference between fiscal federalism and just plain federalism? And do you think that the European Union should move towards becoming a federal state? I don't think that's necessary. Uh, I do think that there should be more... I mean, like, when people say a federal state, you would, one of the most important things, you would give a tax power. Uh, and then taxation, like it actually is the case in America. Uh, I would think that's, a, although I have not against it, I think that would be a step too far, you shouldn't want to do it. But short from being a federal state, there are a lot of more things that can be done at a European level, and all those things I've had like yesterday in my lecture. But do you think those things can be accomplished without a, a, a federal power, sort of a, a top heavy uh, form of not government? Not top heavy, but uh, it should move more in that direction. But it doesn't okay. have to be a complete federal state. And moving more in a direction means to have a, a more politicized European Union, a more politicized commission, a more politicized campaign for uh, for a battle of ideas from where we're going to go to Europe. And then it then turns out that nobody wants Europe, everybody wants to leave it as it is, just have an economic project. Uh, that's fine as well. But at least that's been decided on by the parties. So. I, just, I just wonder if, uh, if, a, if an economic project doesn't, by its very nature, lead into other every other area of politics, because economy blends with so many other... Well, well a good example, we talked a bit about it yesterday, was that um, which is one market, one level market, and they apply that to healthcare as well. And it's been difficult, since you start doing that, then that may be incompatible with the idea of solidarity, or maybe incompatible with the idea of social insurance. Uh, well, that's, that's, really, that's really a political debate. I mean, I'm, of course, in favor of social insurance, I'm in favor of solidarity in the health system, but there may be others, more of a right-wing nature, who say, well, I say to like, 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 people who vote for Bush, as nonsense, everybody should uh, basically insure themselves, and all this idea of solidarity between young and old, or between rich and poor, all rubbish, you shouldn't have it. That's, that's a political debate. It should be, if it can be done at the national level, it should be done at the national level. But some things like healthcare, because people live in many countries in Europe now, there are many issues which are European level, and they should be discussed there. These are, these are typical left wing, right wing debates. To be done. Well, that seems to be all we have time for. Uh, I'm very sorry. No, no, no worries. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Vanderbilt, for, for making time for us. Yeah, cool.